Hello guys, how are you all? Welcome to my channel. So, today we are gonna see, what if Naruto had been taken from his home to become a Spartan movie. Subscribe if you enjoyed the video, and also make sure to check out the author of this fanfic, TRANE7, and support him for writing this awesome fanfic. Link is in the description. Let's start the story. Fascinating Dr. Catherine Halsey was eyeing the image atop her holo table with unhidden curiosity. It had been a month since their first discovery of the planet E2, named to its close similarities to Earth. The UNSC Firefly was orbiting around the planet casually, as scores of UNSC scientists were talking animatedly about the very interesting planet they had discovered. These human-like creatures seem to possess some sort of energy within themselves that allows them to perform superhuman feats, as well as manipulate the elements. Granted, with some level of difficulty, Dr. Halsey dashed her hand through her datapad, oftentimes flicking her finger through separate files before sighing to herself the fact that they had adopted a culture similar to the Japanese is far from astounding, it's mind-boggling, to think we have so much common ground yet can't be any further apart. As she said this the hollow table showed a fight between a mask-wearing soldier fighting against another with a large curved blade that went around his body. He did several hand signs before trees and branches began growing out of the ground and decimated his opponent. Simply fascinating she breathed before cataloging the video for further study. As she did so, she couldn't help but notice the fidgeting ODST by her side, his helmet lying dormant underneath his arm, as his eyes danced over the hologram. Is something the matter of corporals? The ODST tense, his curt no, ma'am was all the answer she needed before she sauntered away. Her curiosity spiking, as she received a video of more of these shinobi fighting. When he passed the threshold of the ship's research room, the corporal relaxed his shoulders, he wouldn't be the first to say that the doctor scared him shitless. Done pissing your pants soldier. The ODST gave the scientist the one-fingered salute and got boisterous laughter in return. One month later, Dr. Catherine Halsey was watching the scene unfold in front of her eyes. UNSC drones scanned the massive creature as safely as they could without getting noticed or destroyed. What were they scanning? A giant nine-tailed fox who was currently destroying one of the militarized villages discovered to be called the Hidden Leaf. She alongside the other scientists had strikes of fear and awe as they watched the massive beast tore the ground asunder and bark out powerful attacks that decimated the area. The doctor passed a few glances to her subordinates and noticed some crying as they watched innocent people get killed. She returned her view to the holodable, her spine shivering involuntarily as the beast ripped apart a battalion of the shinobi. It was then that she noticed a blonde-headed young man drop from the sky atop a large toad. There was a brief scuffle before they teleported elsewhere, appearing several miles away from their previous battle. That was when the doctors felt her curiosity reach its peak. The blonde man had spoken to a red-headed woman, they obviously had an intimate relationship, and then hugged a blonde-headed young baby to his chest, eyes filled with tears and regret, but overshadowed with love and compassion. He turned back to the beast, and Halsey felt her heart lurch, and squeeze at what she saw next. Her eyes shut in dismay, as the blonde man, the Hokage, began sealing the monster into his child. Sadly neither parents would live to see their child, the bodies impaled by one of the fox's claws. Her body was shivering in an emotion she hardly knew, and all of it was directed at the baby. Immediately hundreds upon hundreds of questions began flooding her mind, all directed at that child. So many possibilities now awaiting, should he remain with his people on his homeworld. But there was one, more favorable option for him if Halsey went with what she was thinking. Being the stubborn and compulsive woman that she was, well, you need not guess now do you? Corporal. She ordered through the now cramped observation room. The ODST who had been staring at the scene with his mouth wide open, had probably returned to attention, and saluted the doctor. Yes ma'am Dr. Halsey gave him one of her intellectual, and, to be honest, downright scary looks before she replied quickly grab a team, we're going down to the planet's surface for a capture she ordered, and left the room briskly, leaving behind a confused ODST behind, the hell does she want to snatch, and grab. Though by the looks the scientists were shooting at him, and the apparent tightening of their mouths, they knew, but didn't want to tell, damn eggheads, the corporal muttered lowly. The ODSTs were slightly panicked, as they raced through the forests that surrounded the village. They had missed their window, some of the village soldiers had already taken the child towards their former leader, who would probably retake his seat, Halsey thought. The corporal was behind his commanding officer, his gun held high, and searching his sector. I peeled, and nerves shot, Carlos, Cortez round off the captain hissed, and the troopers broke off from their team, they fired two darts into two ninjas that were sitting on the wall they were going to scale. Their security seems lax, understandable considering the recent attack Halsey commented, and the corporal turned to her with a frown, he had been vehemently against her following them, but when the captain gave the go ahead, he could really say much on the matter anymore. Ladies first the corporal stated, and Halsey gave him a side glance. Then you should hurry up. The corporal nearly fainted at what she said, and there was silence snickering around him. He had played the wrong game with Halsey, the doctor loathed being babysitted, and would just, as much stomp hard down your private areas, then follow that lady's first crap. The corporal shot her glare through his visor before jumping up, and latching himself to the rope that they had thrown over. 
He pulled himself up slightly, and when he passed the wall he activated his VISR, and nearly swore when he saw five red highlights appear. I didn't sign up for this he grumbled, no you signed up for hot blondes, well you got one. His grumblings didn't cease however, when Dr. Halsey peered over the wall after her climb, and glared at the two ODSTs. Well look at what you went, and did. The corporal slapped his helmet with his hand what the hell did I do? Here's and Sir Toby cradled the young baby boy, that had been given such a heavy burden. He shook his hand slightly, as his thoughts drifted to the wacko would you stop playing monkey, and just sit down for dinner. Ah, yes, one of his more fonder memories of her, oh how he missed her so. What is to become of you little Naruto? He asked, little did he know, a group of armored soldiers were capable of hearing him, as they drifted around his office. It was then that three people walked into the room, the Hokage's advisory body. Hears and Kahara greeted, but then her gaze landed on the bab, and her expression hardened. What are we to do with that? Hears and ignored the fact that his old teammates had referred to Naruto as a thing rather than a person. Give them time he thought they'll see it soon enough. It's obvious we can't let news of his birth drift over to the other villagers. They'll have his head the Saratobi replied, and Danzo stepped up at that point. Then perhaps hand him to me, I can take care of him, and give him proper training. As a shinobi Hiruzen's mouth stretched down into a scowl. And allow you to turn him into a weapon. No I don't think so Hiruzen's voice was hard and firm, but it did little to deter the other man. Hiruzen saw light, the Namika's brat had given us a gift, worthy of the name. We shouldn't squander it. At the fourth Hokage, Shamar the man didn't even flinch at his family's name being used, he instead resumed his emotionless face. Eyes not focusing on anyone, but the ideas that formulated in his head. If not trained and detained, Kahara said with finality, and the third Hokage's mouth fell open in shock. Especially when Himura nodded alongside her. The boy is dangerous Hiruzen, he is a demon, and he'll end up destroying our village again. Himura said off to the side, and the Saratobi felt his blood boil. The next hour or so was filled with very loud arguing, and very disgruntled looks. Dr. Halsey could barely contain herself when she heard several of the advisors continue to put forth their, quite honestly, murder plans without an inch of care, that the baby was right there in the room with them. If it weren't for the corporal putting a calm and sturdy hand on her shoulder, she was sure she would have jumped in there and shot them down. They're leaving. The ODST captain commented, and when the advisors had left, the third slumped into his seat, his head lolling back in weariness, as he was cradling the baby, Naruto they heard, in his hands again. I know they seem bad, but I'm sure they'll see you for who you are. Naruto hears and smiled kindly down at him, and the baby wrinkled his nose at the older man, as if the child knew that what he said was a lie. Well I sure, as hell no it is Hulsi thought, the inner mother within her urging her forward. When the Hokage's guard was down long enough the ODST nearest to the man had fired off a dart that landed square in his neck. The old man's head swayed from side to side before he fell unconscious. Move in. The ODSTs burst into the room, and cleared the room, watching the doors and corners, they knew these shinobi could hide anywhere. Dr. Halsey rushed forward, and carefully lifted the child. We have to leave now. The doctor said urgently, and the ODSTs nodded, and didn't need to be told twice. After the ODSTs left the Hokage had woken up hours later, eyes wide open in fear, and shock when he realized Naruto wasn't in his grasp anymore. Naruto. He yelled, as he tore the office apart, only to find nothing of the child. Halsey watched the candidate silently, more specifically the tuft of blonde hair spiking through the masses, as he skillfully dodged them, not wanting to stand out all that much. She smiled slightly, as she recognized who it was almost instantly. Naruto was walking past the crowd of Spartan candidates, his eyes searching for something. Her heart ached slightly, as she thought about the harsh training regime that Naruto would have to endure. She had grown to love him like a son, she cared for him, and taught him. He loved her, and she loved him. There was not a moment in the day where she never regretted her decision to bring Naruto into the Spartan program, but she still didn't like what was going to happen to him. Her lips quivered slightly when she spotted somebody that wasn't supposed to be there. Miranda's long hair stood out in the middle of the young children, as she met up with Naruto on the far wall, her eyes showing worry and concern, while Naruto was excited and energetic, though the bump on his head he got for his attitude was enough to set him straight. Halsey's chest rose, as she saw the two of them together, she had let Naruto meet her daughter once, and after that they had become friends faster than she could even realize. They spent every day together, and every day the scientist was close to squealing in delight every time she saw them, though she did gush about them with Jacob whenever he was around. But her resolve steeled, better he be here, and loved than there, and hated her thoughts drifted to the village advisors, and her eyes grew cold and unfocused, imagining all the pain she could do to them with a the pencil. She tilted her head upwards when she realized how the idea seemed to fill her with a certain happiness. Maybe Mendes' sadism is rubbing off onto me. A penny for your thoughts, doctor. Halsey turned slightly, and smiled warmly when she spotted the Spartan I walked into the room, his stony, and expressionless face offsetting the friendly voice he used. I could say the same to you, I heard that you were rather uneasy with the project. An odd grimace formed on his face before it vanished just, as quickly, if not quicker. 
I come from the day and age where super soldiers are sought after asset, but I've never heard of a government willing to use such methods in order to gain them. Halsey's hand found her heart and she smiled. It was full of pain and guilt. I know, believe me I do, I wish I could go back and destroy my research, but I've committed myself to the project, and to back out now would only serve to put these children, my children in danger. The SCPO turned to her, and his eyes softened a tad bit she's accepted her new role in these kids life he thought. But, they'll be fine, I understand. He said, his voice a quiet sigh, as he turned to the large batch of 150 candidates that were being pushed into something no one should ever be pushed upon. Have you heard of Dr. Leonard Church? Mendes asked, and he spied Halsey giving him a confused look. Yes, I have. She replied, unsure where this is going. Just to make sure the marine thought, as he turned on his heel, and faced her, he's given you an example not to follow. I hope you don't he didn't show an ounce of surprise, when a fiery determination took hold of her face. I would never degenerate myself to the level of that man she said with such passion that the marine was humbled in her presence. I've already set up the team's men to skillfully change the topic, Halsey not noticing, as she pulled out another data pad, and began scanning through and... I've already been able to nudge several of the candidates into their respective teams, blue team, red team, and green team, each with their own designated duties however. He frowned at this, Naruto's currently without a team, am I right to assume you wish to make him an all-round Spartan with no specialties? He asked, but was met with Halsey's quick shake. Yes, I know at Mendes raised eyebrow she elaborated, he's to be trained in stealth and assassination, but knowing Naruto's impatience, I want him trained in frontline heavy munitions, and to be fitted in each team if necessary the Spartan I nodded his head in her direction, showing he understood his orders, and was going to fulfill them. As you wish doctor he turned on his heel, and made his way down, Halsey noticed Miranda having slipped away, and disappeared back to wherever she came from, and Naruto was boasting excitedly to himself. Their smile broadened when he somehow got into a tussle with one of the other candidates, because he was boasting excitedly to himself. Naruto she shook her head lightly before returning to scanning her datapad, what wonders awaited her Spartans. One year later, move it you cadets. Naruto huffed, as he slid down, and under the three gigantic tree roots that inhabited the forests of Reach. Pulling out his MA-5B, designed for training purposes so it fired rubber bullets that sting like hell, and burned like napam, he crouched, and walked over to a tree. Free for all catch of the flag, just my idea of fun Naruto grinned savagely, as he noticed a cadet shooting off into the distance. He squared his shoulders, and slinked down into the dense woodlands. Spartans were trained to be efficient and brutal, but to never bring harm on their own, on their family, so with that thought in mind, Naruto eased himself into the woods, eyes watching each tense muscle, and terse movement of his opposition. His eyes glazed over, as his instincts took hold, and he pulled himself forward, taking the distance that separated him from his target before. The Naruto's cheeky voice caused the cadet to jump into the air, before he was gunned down by Naruto's assault rifle, his armor flashing red before they locked down, and prevented movement. Damn it Naruto. The cadet cursed, and Naruto chortled at the position the cadet was trapped in, hands flailed in the air, and right leg up in a kick. Sorry Seamus, but it wasn't my fault that you were so scared. Very funny, now shut the fuck up, and go before I gut you with my harsh words. Naruto gasped, as he held his heart in what appeared to be a gesture of shock such language he said over dramatically young man you're only 7 years old. Seamus grew an irritated tick mark, as he shook his head vigorously to try, and hit the blonde boy with his forehead, and I'm when you're your senior so respect me, and walk before I shove my boot up your ass during full out time. Naruto grinned at him, and waved goodbye, as he sprinted off just wait till full out. He heard Seamus last hooray before he disappeared in the dense foliage. In the observation room, SCPO Mendes was watching the day's training with great scrutiny, as he assessed each of the individual cadets for any flaws he would need to work on. Already the arrogance and pompous attitudes of the members of Grey Team were bursting off his confines, as they not once nor twice, but fifteen times disobeyed one of Mendes' most taught skills. Get the hell in cover when you're being shot at you damn retarded apes. He heard one of the instructors, a regular disciplinarian for the team, sigh in the background somebody kill me now he whined pitifully, as he won the members, Mike, accidentally broke one of the cadet's ankles. Mendes frown deepened, another thing he had drilled into their heads, Spartans are your family, and you don't hurt your family. Though his judgment and anger were calmed when he noticed the large flinch Mike gave at the cadet's shout of pain, later scooping him, and positioning him on a tree branch, so he could rest his leg, after he locked down the armor of course. The learning Mendes muttered, too quietly for the others in the room to hear, but loud enough to reassure himself. His eyes traveled from Mike towards Naruto, Halsey's kid, and he immediately began his deep dissection of the boy. Halsey had given him a rundown on Naruto's people, and his body's capabilities. The boy wasn't even classified as human. Sure he looked human, but his DNA was so different that he wasn't, enough to be regarded human-like, but different enough to be a whole new species. Their characteristics were different to that of humanity, one thing their bones were slightly more hollow than a human, a common trait in birds, but an evolution that had been spread through their people to meet their needs for speed. 
To add to that Naruto's muscles were designed in a way that made them compact. The whole thing just seemed far too complicated for Mendes to dare understand, so he merely skimmed and tossed it aside. He watched silently, as Naruto rushed into a group of cadets who were engaged in a firefight, his gun hammering out rounds into the dense forest to confuse enemies before rolling down, and taking out two cadets who were befuddled at seeing the blonde. They cried out in dismay, as their armors locked, and the blonde disappeared into the foliage. Mendes grinned at the boy's actions, true to his words Naruto was given basic frontline training in the course of the year, before being separated to be trained in traditional stealth and counter-insurgency tactics. The blonde whined and complained, but took everything like a depraved bear during hunting season, in other words, he molded and blended each of his training to form his own type of guerrilla warfare that centered around shock and awe. To further add to this Naruto was trained with each Spartan team, red team, blue team, black team, every team except gray team, because well, yay let's not start with the chaos that would become of that. Thus, Naruto was a jack of all trades soldier who was trained to be adaptable to any unit and situation, a deadly foe, and a better friend. The boy grew inseparable bonds with the Spartans. Growing a close relationship with several of the prime candidates such as Kali, Linda, Seamus, Vivian, and Sam, through Sam he had met John, and the two became close. Where John was, Naruto was never far behind a fact that seemed to put off Sam, and by a lesser degree, Kelly. You know that blonde kids have to be more attentive one of the instructors, Graham, said. What makes you say that another instructor, Brandon, asked. Without a word Graham nudged his chin to the direction of the section of jungle, and Mendes squinted his eyes to see a certain Spartan candidate itching behind the wildly shooting Naruto. Oh oh was right, the boy was kicked in a place where a man should never be kicked in, and was now in a tug of war while cradling his jewels. I'm not sure if Halsey's daughter's gonna be all okay with the Snickers rang across the room, and Mendes bristle perverts, ah. Vivian, woman why? Naruto was rolling around on the ground, hands pressed firmly on his aching groin, as he skillfully dodged the rubber bullets, by rolling past as many trees, bushes, and mounds of dirty could find. Free for all Naruto she sang, and sprinted after the blonde, finger coiled tightly around the trigger. You forgot to capture the flag. Capture the flag. Naruto had sprang up and dived behind an oversized root, hands clenched, as he had broke rule number one never drop your gun, because if you do then you might as well already be dead. Vivian come on, are you still made about the shampoo prank? Naruto asked, though those really weren't the best words to say. My hair was bright pink for a week. And the whole thing clung together and nearly ripped my scalp in half. She seethed, face flushed and brimming in anger. Ah Naruto cursed, as a steady stream of rubber bullets slammed against the root, Vivian's footfalls making a beeline for his position. Naruto pressed his back against the root, his lifted slightly to prepare himself for his maneuver, and his mind flashed to an advice his mother figure's husband had said when facing a young irate woman who wants nothing, but to rip your balls in half, just don't look, and run don't ever, and I mean never try to attack her. Dear god what am I about to do Naruto blanched, as he poisoned himself before, he shot his hand out, and grabbed the gun that peeked over the root, a few stray bullets being sprayed before Naruto forced the, but of the gun into Vivian's right shoulder, forcing the girl to gasp, and try to regain her grip on her gun, but all too late it would seem. The blonde jumped upward, his lightweight playing to his favor, as he backflipped over Vivian's body, and landed behind her, hands wrapping around her waist, and with a cheeky smile, he pulled out her sidearm, and pinned the barrel to her stomach. I'm sure the instructors love this. He whispered into her ear, right before he fired a round, and a yelp of surprise, and pain, followed by the thrum of her BDU systems locking down. Damn it. She cursed, and she shot Naruto with an angry glare. You better hope you're nowhere near me during fallout time. She warned, and he began laughing into the air. Are you kidding me, fallout time's just a myth old man chief made up to. Attention cadets fallout time has been initiated, preparing for unlock in 5 Naruto's breath left his lungs, as his hands fell limply by his sides, eyes flickering to the observation room located up on the southern side of the arena, where he saw SCPO Mendes simply staring down at his position. At that time he realized a huge mistake he had made, and above all else, never, ever disrespect the chief. His eyes drifted to Vivian near a deranged smile, as her armor flashed, and her hands felt free to allow movement. Any last words she growled, as she towered over the cowering Naruto. I'm not the face. Her smile brought and I had a better place in mind. Mendes flinched, as Naruto's loud screams reached his ears, quietly noticing how several of the cadets had stopped, and began listening to the pitiful pleas of stop, and mercy. Graham coughed into his hand, as the screams began to turn his head a little green, I think I'll uh, leave the room. Mendes felt like walking away too, but instead opted to remain seated, bring me the recorded while you leave. This would make great motivation should Naruto slack in his training. The instructor gave the SCPO an incredulous look, but when the serious expression only became more serious, he nodded his head wearily before passing him the recorder. As he left he heard Brandon mutter, you don't think he has stuff like that on us do you? 
Graham stopped for a moment, a faint bit of fear, and thought bubbling inside him, but he had wished he hadn't stopped for the next things to be said, were far worse than an alien invasion, than even the apocalypse so believe me, I have far more motivational things. Naruto grinned to himself, as he slid his tray full of food down the table, and heard it clank against Seamus's own. The blonde grin at the annoyed expression on the Irish male, next to him John, Sam, and Kelly, were looking in amusement at their interaction. So Kelly, Sam, 17, and Mama Bear Seamus growled underneath his breath when he heard Naruto say that. Would you stop calling me that already? His indignant remark only made Naruto's grin widen. Whatever you say mama bear, but I heard Lilith's going on a walk. Are you sure you don't want to follow her to make sure she doesn't get abducted by aliens or something? He groaned, as Naruto laughed at his expression. Lovely weather ain't it? He perked up a bit when he swiveled his head to see Vivian, and Catherine marching up behind Naruto, their faces sporting wide smiles, and a tray full of army regulated pieces of garbage. Lovely enough not to see your ugly ass Seema smuttered, and yelled in pain when a dehydrated chicken wing slapped his forehead. Naruto laughed out loud again with John following a short while later, his one more subdued, but still grating on Seamus's nerves. Don't take it personally Viv he only has eyes on Lilith. Catherine remarked slyly towards Vivian, though her voice carried over to two tables down. Seamus gave an exasperated sigh, as he flopped lifelessly against the table. It wasn't like he was orbiting around her. He just helped out on her training, and the girl was so shy too. With his awesomeness he could probably get her to open up, plus she needed a strong brother figure, and Seamus was that person. You guys suck he growled, and was met with a harsh, though admittedly welcomed, slap on his back. Cheer up but I'm sure times are calling soon for you to tie the knot. Naruto laughed aloud again, his hands clutching his sides to keep his gut from exploding. Damn it you got blue team mixed with this shit. Seamus seethed, there goes the only people who would leave the topic well enough alone. Catherine and Vivian giggled, the contents on their trays bouncing up, and down with their rhythmic sounds. The two girls sat down onto the table, Catherine's short shoulder-length brown hair bouncing in sync to own black shoulder-length hair. We'll see you guys later Mendes wants us on a match with green team Kelly replied, as she pushed herself off the bench, Sam letting out an excited Kurtz going down hard today. Kelly and Sam waved goodbye to Indigo team, while Seamus, Catherine, and Vivian were part of Indigo Naruto was still a lone wolf, and John rustled Naruto's hair, a grin on his face, as he whispered deltas on the rear guard. Naruto flashed a grin at him, and a thumbs up, as he acknowledged the code in his own special way. John chuckled to himself before walking away to follow his teammates, while he did so Naruto felt excitement well up inside him, that meant Miranda was dropping by. This was going to be awesome. Hey can I sit here? Naruto snapped back into reality when he heard Seamus give off an approval, turning to face the newcomer. A warm expression filled Naruto's face when he spotted Saren sitting there quietly. The short black-haired girl smiled politely at the indigo team, her back straightening somewhat when she felt her recent bruises catch up with her. How's the injuries? I hope great team didn't rough you up too bad. Saren's smile became a little bit more true when she heard Vivian's worried tone, she nodded her head, and tucked her sleeves forward to hide the scars. It wasn't too bad, though Adriana was a bit more forceful today. I think she and Jai had a fight. She remarked, passing a weary glance over her shoulder where the great team were currently sitting. Those guys if it were up to me I'd probably lock them up in a cage, Seema smuttered under his breath, pushing a piece of broccoli off his play dog, damn nasty things. Careful Seamus, what would Lil think if she found out about what you were into Catherine quipped. The Irish clenched his fist in annoyance, muttering I'm gonna keep quiet now under his breath. Naruto shook his head, and sent the girl a smile, don't let it get to you, great team's just really eccentric Saren waved away his words with a disarming smile, don't worry I have no hard feeling with them, Mo Dr. Halsey told me that the bruises would heal within a week, there was a tiny pinch of pink on her cheeks, when she realized her near mess up, a side effect with hanging around Jorge far too much, Naruto patted her head, which gained an annoyed grunt from her, and walked away toward the sparring gym, he wanted to get a few hours in before Miranda came, Lieutenant Commander Jacob Keyes was nodding his head quietly, not quite understanding the incoherent babbling of his wife, that continued to talk about her Spartans on her children's latest adventures, and family stories. Jacob smiled slightly, when did my family become so big? He still remembered when he was, but a fresh out of the academy ensign, and had expressed his desire to start a family with his father, who later bluntly stated once you have one child, that's when your life ends. Jacob found that line both a lie, and some truth. When Miranda was born he had showered her with the love of 10 Helsing class cruisers to do to an enemy flagship, in other words, he spoiled her pretty badly when she was still a toddler. His wife, the ever intellectual Catherine Halsey who was also the ever sexy woman in a nightgown, was the single most greatest woman he knew, and also the most stubborn, hell he was pretty sure she was the brawn in their relationship. But he loved her just as much as Miranda, and was willing to do anything for her, even standing through her insatiably hard to comprehend mini speeches. 
for Jacob his life did end with marriage, as well as some aspects of his military career, with him needing more downtime to spend with Miranda. But it ended for the better, as a whole new chapter had been opened to him, and a part of that chapter was the Spartan children. If Halsey was the mother figure, and Mendes the father figure, then Jacob was the estranged uncle who was caught in between an affair with their mother. He loved those kids, though more so with Naruto and John, as he was more acquainted with them, and he was proud with how his wife was treating them. Ever since the founding of the Spartans his normally tight-lipped, and down-to-business scientist, had became an all-smiles, and happy adopted mother to the children. There were literally a shed full of albums off each, and every Spartan candidate from when they were inducted two years ago. As loathed as Halsey was to admit this, but she was becoming a budding housewife if I was a housewife, then the lab was my house, and the couch was your bed she retorted every time. And there has been talk about Jorge and CERN, that's quite the rumor isn't it half the girls are rooting for it, but the other half aren't quite sure Jacob smiled to himself, yes he wouldn't have his life now any other way. Catherine the first was pretty sure you wanted to talk to me about something other than the kids love life, which I might add they are still too young for a love life, Halsey gave him an amused grin, the edges of her eyes crinkling into a wink, but yet you approve of Naruto, and Miranda the man snorted, straightening his uniform, as he did so. I approve nothing you made me sleep outside the house until I did a sour expression spread across Jacob's face before it smoothened out into a placid smile, and yet here I am, still madly in love with you. Catherine slapped his hand and sauntered past him, why are you the flirt today? Her tone wasn't alluring nor quizzical, but all the same Jacob felt drawn to it, always been, love. Why are you too much fluff? Continuing with a productive topic, there is a certain problem I'd like to point out to you. Jacob sobered up quickly, recognizing the tone of voice Halsey was using, as something very grave and important. With a slight incline of his head, Dr. Halsey continued it seems, as though one has caught whiff to Naruto's unique condition. Halsey's face was twisted in grief and horror. Jacob fared no better. How? But that question only served to further destroy Halsey's mood, the air around her shifting to guilt I was too overconfident, I forgot to check on the medical reports being sent through, and she was cut off, as she felt warm strong hands wrapping around her, and pulling her into the softly beating heart of her husband. Halsey shifted herself slightly to press her cheek into the man's chest, seeking his comfort. It wasn't your fault Catherine. The words were so smooth coming from his lips everything's gonna be alright. She gripped his uniform, hoping what he said was true, as she relaxed against him. They don't know Naruto's not exactly human, she announced. All they really found out was the secondary circulatory system in his body, which could be either a genetic mutation or the result of some unforeseen results of exposing Mendes to them. Though they'd probably discard that line if thought Jacob nodded. So the news isn't as troubling, but still troubling. Jacob if they found out, I, I don't even want to think what they'd do to him she whimpered. The lives of one of her children was at stake. Don't worry Halsey, we'll get it sorted out, I promise. She nodded against him, and closed her eyes, falling dreamlessly against his beating heart. So much fluff. Naruto was grinning, as Miranda told him the stories of the colony world, not unlike his homeworld of Reach, but still holding an array of things that reached Naruto's interest. So how was your time? Miranda asked, her face looking to him in curiosity, head cocked to the side, and eyes wide, in order to get all the details he would give for it. Naruto gave her his patented fox grin, his fangs glinting in the sun in a way that made the girl blush. Well where to start? He snorted that Seamus is still being Lilith's big brother, what a clueless guy Miranda sighed, both for poor Lilith, and the irony of the sentence. Linda's been on heads with Fred on who's the best shot, and John's got some kind of budding romance with Kelly, I think so at least, you can never really know of the guy Naruto continued to rattle on about various things the Spartans had done, some made Miranda giggle other got raised eyebrows, and shocked looks. But through it all, the girl could not help, but hear his tone of fondness, how his eyes softened each time he mentioned one of the Spartan names, and there was a smile on his face through, and through. For a moment Miranda felt a pang of jealousy that Naruto cared so much for the Spartan, but squashed it immediately, she inched closer to Naruto, enough that their elbows were bumping against each other, and was inwardly squealing when Naruto wrapped his hand around hers almost automatically. His shoulder leaning against hers in that oh so boyish way. Highly annoying, and severely heavy for her to support, she wouldn't have it any other way. Then there's Kurt, his super secret sixth sense. I just think he found a way to hack into the cameras, probably spying on the girl's shower room. At this time Naruto had leaned the back of his head on Miranda's shoulder, and the black-haired girl, slightly brown from her father's side, I know Halsey's supposed to have brown hair, and sigh wistfully, as she nuzzled her face in his blonde locks. Sleepy. Naruto's teasing voice did not deter her in the slightest. Maybe, I did have to sit in a six-hour trip to get her you know, she more felt Naruto's chuckle than heard it. I wake up four in the morning every day, with big sweaty marines, dragging me out of bed kicking, and screaming, she cracked a smile, and nearly giggled at the thought of seeing Naruto like. Her eyes blinked slightly, as she further pushed herself against Naruto's soft hair, and heard Naruto sigh contently in their position. Her cheeks were flooded with red at how intimate everything was, and felt like confessing to Naruto then, and there. 
Going to sleep Miranda she turned her head slightly to look out at the setting sun of reach, and felt her heart flutter at the scene, especially when Naruto shifted himself slightly, letting Miranda slide her head onto his own shoulder, and wrapping a protective hand around her body. The girl was prepared to heed his command, her eyes shutting close to the scene. She wasn't quite there to confess her emotions yet, but she was getting there, and when she did she'd be content, as she was now. I'll be right here watching Naruto reassured her, and the girl cracked a smile I know. Dr. Halsey watched harmlessly from her position aboard the UNSC Miss Lee. The young blonde was drifting her hands through several data pads all at once, as she heard the several bleeps of the Spartans on the ground. Blue 2 moving in Roger Blue 2 Blue 3 cover 2's advance acknowledge Blue actual be advised Indigo approaching your 6 Roger Indigo. The several voices were punctuated with brief bursts of fire, as her Spartans continued to clear the warehouse of any insurrectionists with ease, that followed their military doctrine shock and awe. Dr. Halsey, Indigo is approaching Priority Gamma. Movements in the southwest have alerted them to the presence of an escaping task force. The blonde turned to address the young lady that was seated in a wheelchair next to her. Saren, sitting there with a blanket over her legs, had been one of the many Spartans who had failed to perfectly sync with the augmentations, and truly be told the only reason why she had survived, was due thanks to the extensive research the members of her team had done on Naruto's inner energy called Chakra. It was marveling to say the least, the compound was capable of perfecting the augmentation beyond what they could imagine. The fact also remained that the energy was trapped within some form of gaseous and liquid state that allowed for research data. In understanding it, more like just scratching their heads and muttering curses, they had developed an augmentation that had a near zero mortality rate. But nonetheless, not all of the candidates made it through the very painful procedure, a fact that had Halsey bedridden for weeks before it took the entire personnel, Spartan, and staff included, to go there out with the promise of Naruto taking Miranda out on a date. Though neither of the two had actually agreed with this. Have green team intercept them, move red team to the northern sector Halsey ordered. Though she wasn't a battlefield commander, she had enough intellect and experience herself to be confident in leading her Spartans on the ground. Roger. Saren replied without a shred of hesitation, loyalty, and respect shining in her eyes, as she gave Dr. Halsey, a woman she secretly called mother, a crisp salute before wheeling forward to give the commands. Dr. Halsey returned her attention to the holodable where several blue arrows were closing in on a contingent of red dots. To the people on the bridge who didn't know her personally, most would think she was utterly calm and stoked to the situation at hand, but for Saren, who had spent a lot of time with the woman compared to her peers during her time in rehab, could see the signs of wear, and tear followed by near hysterical panic in her eyes, as she scrutinized the screen with expert precision. Note. Buy Halsey a bag of chocolate chip cookies Saren thought, as she dashed her hands across her instruments. This is Hammer. VIP is on the move. I repeat VIP is on the move damn look at him go, that guy is supposed to be 80 years old. The young 13 year old female felt the edges of her lips quirk up, and a brief giggle escaped her lips when the voice of both Naruto and Seamus speared through the communications link. It was brief static before Seamus's voice cut through as this guy part rabbit. Somebody tell Blue 2 to get her ass in gear and book it to my position. Hammer formed up on me, we're taking care of his security detail. She heard the chief petty officer first class order the chief petty officer second class. Roger, Hammer reforming. Two blue dots on the screen in front of Halsey began accelerating their pace towards a gold dot that was losing as much ground as he was gaining as the augmented soldiers dashed through the base, cutting down the few enemy infantry that tried to slow them down. Indigo 3, Indigo actually is cutting it towards checkpoint Fiona, see if you can't herd him to our position, a sharp female voice ordered. Catherine a chief petty officer, an acting squad leader of Indigo team ordered. Roger Indigo 1, Hammer uses that shotgun with some worth. You know I will. Naruto replied. Halsey flicked her wrist on her data pad, and a sudden screen floated just above her holo table, revealing the pop of a Spartan soldier carrying a shotgun on the surface of the world they were currently orbiting. On the top right hand side there were the words hammer written in big red letters. The soldier, Naruto, wielded his shotgun one handed, as an M6G Magnum pistol rested in his other hand. The soldier dived forward with a roll, behind him the sounds of automatic fire from an M837 began to cackle, and when he straightened himself out from his roll with expert precision, he trained the barrel of his shotgun into the chest of a nearby insurrectionist soldier, while the other hand was aiming to a group that was hiding behind some crates to his left. In only a split second he had squeezed both triggers, and the shotgun pellet slammed into the fabric of the inny soldier, while the magnum's explosive rounds ripped the other group into smithereens. Opting to not fight against the recoil, he used the added push to speed himself forward, where he rammed his shoulder into another soldier, and dropped to the ground while firing off rounds from his magnum, as his other hand cocked the shotgun back into action. The innie he had rammed into began gurgling out blood, as his ribs cracked, and his internal organs failed, while several armed militia found bullet holes in between their eyes, as they tried to destroy the army of invincible soldiers. Hammer, suppress the enemy. It was an affirmative from a deep gravelly voice underneath the Mjolnir Mark IV helmet, as the chemically augmented soldier resumed his bloody crusade through the base. 
Halsey, who has seen the carnage done by Naruto, known as Hammer to several UNSC personnel aboard the UNSC Misli, was watching with the form of a guilty burden on her chest, as she watched the bright and sunny blonde kill the enemy with ruthless efficiency. On the side of him pulling free a pin from a fragmentation grenade, and unflinchingly toss it into a shower room where several soldiers were currently slapping on their uniforms, Halsey felt shame in turning these kids into war machines. Hey Indigo 3, when this is over you, and I are sneaking off to New Alexandria. The sudden shout from Naruto caused Halsey to jump slightly, but a short surprise was interrupted, as the radio started to crackle to life. If we do then we're going to the dance club Vivian dear god. Can you guys shut it we're on a mission Seamus does it look like I care. I need some long time girl Catherine the first don't want to know what you do in your long time, thank you very much. The statement was followed by several amused laughter by the other Spartans assembled on the planet even. Kurt began hollering into the radio Lilith's, gonna have a field day with this. Halsey smiled to herself, though she was uncertain whether to be worried or not, as they were joking on a battlefield, but she knew her children were far from killing machines. Confirmed death. VIP has been terminated, all Spartans move to LZ Benedict. The voice of John 117 boomed through the communications, as the leading Spartans spearheaded a full retreat from the base, several of the Spartans in the rear, launching various suppressing fires down on their enemies, with their overlapping fields of fire. When the team had successfully cleared the zone there was another voice that came through the radio, this is Blue 3 go ahead for release on bomb. There was a moment of silence before Saren clicked on the radio when she got a nod from Halsey, you are go for release. The two women couldn't feel it, but the ground around the insurrectionist base suddenly began to shake violently, as a large mushroom cloud took to the skies right above the former place Colonel Robert Watts used to reside in. The blonde woman let out a slow and easy sigh as she straightened herself from the nerve-wracking problems the mother of 120 super-powered children had to deal with. Saren please perform the necessary procedures before John and the rest return Halsey asked as the young girl nodded her head. Thank you darling Saren's cheeks colored at the affectionate way Halsey regarded her before the woman left the bridge towards the cargo bay. The testing of both the Spartan IIs and the Mjolnir Mark IV was a success. This would only serve as a serious boon for the UNSC, in both repelling the insurrectionist movement, but also the new larger threat that had loomed over one of their colony worlds. The doctor marched down the hallways feeling both lightheaded and severely aloof, as she tried to compress all the information that had been shoved into the latest reports she had garnered from her clearance in Oni. One was the invasion of Harvest by a collective of alien species calling themselves as the Covenant, second was the fact that Vice Admiral Cole had procured the largest fleet in UNSC history, and was moving on a campaign to retake Harvest, third was the very worrying fact that Miranda joined flight school. She was vehemently against it, and blamed only Jacob for allowing their daughter to join at such a young age. Dr. Halsey the blonde spared a passing glance to an ornately dressed Oni officer, matching her pace next to her. I would assume the test results were a success. He asked, only Lieutenant Galson Jorge was a young male around the age of his early 20s. He was an exceptional field agent, and a cunning individual, though admittedly nothing compared to Halsey, with a track record to boot. Halsey gave the man a curt nod, not wanting to spend any further time than absolutely needed with him. And how is test subject Alpha? He questioned, and like it or not, Halsey couldn't stop the guarded expression that twisted across her face, so much so that it could only be described as one thing maternal drive. He is doing quite fine over the years both she and several staff personnel, Jacob included, had strung up an intricate piece of white line to cover up the discovery of Naruto's second circulatory system. They had buried it under so much utter bullshit and scientific brilliance that Oni had completely fallen for it, though many didn't get the idea behind it. Thus the codename Test Subject Alpha was the favorite name for Naruto, as Oni had backed off from their recent discovery, as Halsey's little lie had conveniently put Naruto within the parameters of the Spartan project, though that didn't mean they didn't send in their own technical advisor to the best of their knowledge. Naruto's chemical augmentation resided within the circulatory system instead of becoming part of his body. In many aspects many saw Naruto as nothing but a failure, though there were heads butting around with the idea of using this method to augment marines and adults. Yes well, you'd best prepare your Spartans, there's been news of the Covenant making an advance towards Kai CD4, and Highcom is committed to not let that planet fall, the Oni agent remarked, as they passed the threshold between the cargo bay, and the rest of the ship. Halsey shot in one of her passive-aggressive looks that carried all of her intellectual prowess, and feminine fury, drowning him in what could only be described, as the stare of hell. I can assure you lieutenant that my Spartans are more than ready to deal with the Covenant threat, and with that being said you have nothing to worry about she remarked, a twinge bit of a sneer in her words. The only operative shook the cold chill on his shoulder off, and returned his even stare on the good doctor. Be that, as it may there are further orders for your Spartans, the planet Harvest is currently in need of your unit's expertise, while the UNSC HICOM requests that a number of Spartans be placed on the UNSC carriers, and Frigga Staggers Tip, Reverence, Bujiman, Spirit of Fire, J.K. Stevenson, and Pitbull. Halsey already knew this, and had already split her Spartans into their respective teams to be deployed once they were debriefed. 
but she wasn't mistaken, they were already being debriefed, as she spoke with the Oni intelligence officer. Yes well, then good luck to you. The officer turned on his heel, and made haste towards his quarters in the ship. Halsey gave one last withering glare to his back, as he left before her hand drifted through her datapad. Spartan Team Assignments, Deployment, Aqua, Team UNSC Reverence, Yellow, Team Bujiman, Red Team Spirit of Fire, Gold Team Pitbull, Green, Team JK Stevenson, Purple Team Daggers Tip, Assignment, Battlefield Engagements, Blue, Team GCD4, Red Team Outer Colony Worlds, Gray Team Repurposing in Progress. Her hand stopped a bit, as she hesitantly drifted her hand over a particular set of names. She sucked in a shaky breath before she pressed her finger down on the holographic image. Indigo Team Link with Hammer, Repurposing Catherine 116, Vivian 097 Sima 069, Redeployed, as Hammer 1 to 3, Naruto 107 Designated Hammer 5, Hammer Team Deployed to the Harvest Battle Group. Her mouth collapsed into a near-hysterical frown when another bout of motherly worry filled her gut with such force that she nearly keeled over. Where's Jacob when I need him? She whimpered. The UNSC Hampton was a small frigate in the UNSC fleet. It had seen battle in the earliest of conflicts such as the Rainforest Wars, and the beginning of the insurrection in 2494, the ship had undergone several retrofits, and upgrades, as the years went by, and it was given the nickname, the Lone Cavalry. Mostly due to the reputation the ship, and its vast array of previous captains, had when engaging both ground, and naval combats. Holding some of the most experienced marine contingents, and the most elites of the ODST battalions, it is home to many army personnel It swore a solemn oath to protect, and defend, if need be destroyed, as well. It was in this ship that a tall muscular 13-year-old stood, his black dress uniform tucked underneath his arm, as he stared at the streams of white light that passed by the window, while the ship traversed through slip space. Nice view, he muttered. The boy was not long past his puberty, but stood, as tall, and, as broad, as a 17-year-old bodybuilder, but even so he knew his physique was nothing compared to his brothers, and sisters. While their bodies looked like they were built for pure strength, and domination of the battlefield his body was more streamlined, narrow, and bulky in the areas that wouldn't affect his speed. His augmentations were special Halsey told him, but he knew better, and he knew that better was located right above his stomach. Absent-mindedly wiping his hands over it, as if the action would destroy the monster hidden within, he frowned. A burrito for your thoughts. The muscular blonde turned just in time to catch a ball of tinfoil from hitting his face, staring at the piece of silvery wrapping he smelled the scent of cooked spices, and other food stuff wafting out of it. How do you smuggle it in? He turned a pointed look towards the other male in the room, but only got a chuckle in return. The blonde in front of him had the same disheveled hair, as he did though more shorter, and tamed. Strong set of jaws, and pale skin, he was almost a direct copy of so many other Spartans. That my friend is a story for another time or at least when I'm sure there aren't any cameras Halsey's eavesdropping from. He turned a pointed look to a security camera in the back, and the other male nodded, grinning. Yeah I thought you'd say that he replied. Naruto come on man if you need anything. Seamus became silent, eyes drifting down to Naruto's stomach as well. Naruto frowned to himself, he understood their fear whenever around him, it hadn't changed much since the incident, and while the Spartans were, as supportive, as they could be, Naruto knew they weren't all too sure they could trust him. John was trying, he really was, but after what he did, well let's say Naruto didn't blame any of them. I'm fine. He replied, acting as though he hadn't noticed. Seamus hesitated a moment before taking a spot next to the blonde, he was wearing his dress uniform, a purple heart, and two campaign ribbons adorning the sides. The other blonde was quiet, a silence drifting through them before Seamus finally spoke up. Hard to believe isn't it? That we're being called to extinction by an alien race. We all knew first contact was going to happen, and all the sci-fi movies never really painted a pretty picture now did they? Naruto demurred, but Seamus wasn't so convinced, but still, an entire planet of people lost, that's just not right Seamus passed a look out the window again, a troubled look on his face. Well, there were reports of a group of the colonial militia getting a few out of the hellfire when it came down Seamus allowed, damn good soldiers, I heard one of them was a Spartan I like the chief Naruto hummed a bit, the usually loud blonde a quiet stature. Even so, we're not supposed to chew our lips on what had happened, our job now is to retake it, and show these Xenos that we won't go down without a bloody war, Seamus smiled at the fire in Naruto's words, and he clapped him on the back happily, Catherine wants us suited up in about an hour. Pack for a quick drop behind enemy lines we will be aiming them for when they're at their weakest. Naruto grinned at the older boy when their pants were down, and they were shitting themselves. Ain't no other way to say it. The UNSC Hampton drifted next to the much larger Paris class destroyer that seemed to rumble, as it exited slip space. Though small the ship may be, it was designed for war unlike any other. Point defense systems littered the hull of the ship with a large array of archer missile pods adorning the front, and its signature Mac cannon primary gun sitting comfortably underneath its hull. The ship was deceptively small for its great lethality. Strictly in naval combat it was a fast and deadly foe, but it was just as deadly on the ground as any other ship. 
even as the ship took up position next to the Marathon class cruiser. The UNSC Falcon, scores upon scores of Marines were preparing themselves to offload onto the surface of harvest on their Albatross troop carriers and Pelican dropships, the ODST having a more robust way of entering the battlefield. Among these veteran foot soldiers laid one of the UNSC most elite and deadliest, the UNSC Spartan commandos, who were now waiting with the other soldiers on their own go-ahead. It was knowing this that UNSC Captain Nikolai Reznov was silent, as his ship rounded past the larger ships of battle group Harvest, to look at this new and very alien threat. It was truly something beyond human imagination. They were round and bulbous in certain areas, but maintained a sleek and angled exterior, a respectable elegance that far outstripped the human utilitarian warships. But even so, Captain Nikolai wasn't as impressed as any of the other captains. Indeed he was a hard man to please, but be that as it may there was a certain voice in him that reminded him the first and utmost rule in combat respect thy enemy, respect thyself. He squared his shoulders and turned a passing look to his so armed primary cannons. Prepare archer pots A to G, get interceptors to form a tight formation around the fleet, remember our job is to get to harvest, leave the major fighting to the larger ships. The captain ordered, and the Zoe gave a crisp salute before rounding away to follow up on the orders. Satin called for his AI. Immediately a petite young woman ranging from the age of her late teens to early twenties, stood atop a podium to his left, a tasteful white gown adorning her body, and a shock of beautiful brown hair atop her head. Yes captain. The woman asked, her voice so silky, and smooth the captain, and quite a few of his crew, was slightly lulled by her sound. Prepare a firing solution for the corvette at the outer left of the enemy fleet, and contact the captain of the UNSC Falcon to cover our advance. The woman gave a melodic eye eye captain, before disappearing to perform her duties. Lieutenant Ambrose, status on the weapons a young blonde woman nodded her head before applying that cannon is at 87%, and climbing, archer missiles primed and ready, point defense systems primed and ready, railgun stations aid at DR at 89%, and secondary cannons are primed and ready she reported. Sir? Interceptors are launching, reforming on the UNSC crossroads. A naval officer yelled from his station. The captain nodded, as he sank into his seat. Now all he needed was a service Admiral Cole, ordering a full attack on the Covenant fleet. The Russian grinned, as he straightened his captain's hat, passing a glance to Lieutenant Ambrose. He gave her a sharp nod before he ordered launch archer missiles. Interceptors break off, and engage enemy ships. Secondary cannons aim for the smaller frigates. No sooner had the words left his mouth did the archer missiles launch past their pods, and in almost the blink of an eye that impacted against the Covenant ships, followed by many other salvos. Reporting minor damage to the enemy fleet, six corvettes have been stripped of their shielding, and the rest of the twenty ships are preparing to launch a counterattack. The Zoe reported, right, as the Covenant replied in turn with their own plasma torpedoes, the slow, and arching ball of blue energy, raced past the expanse of space before impacting heavily onto several Marathon-class cruisers. The entire front of some ships were ripped to shreds before their reactors went nuclear and exploded. Sir we lost three UNSC Marathon class cruisers, while the other four are reporting massive hull damage. The color almost strained from Nikolai's face before he set it back into grim determination. Vice Admiral Cole is ordering full flank speed towards 260 by 030, all interceptors on course to engage enemy fighters. Set course correction, launch longswords, prepare map cannons. The ship lurched forward, as the blocky frigate raced upwards, cresting the UNSC Falcon, before taking a firing position near its center. The small frigate's bow shined slightly, as energy was redirected to the mass accelerator railgun at its underbelly. Sir Vice Admiral Cole is ordering a full garage. Target position 56 degrees by 35, Mac cannon primed and ready, sir. Lieutenant Ambrose reported, the captain nodded before replying to open fire. The 170-ton tungsten round launched from the confines of its nozzle, before screening past the distance between the ship and the enemy corvette it sighted itself on. The shielding was already gone, and with it so was half the ship, as the kinetic force of the massive slug slammed into the bow of the ship and escaped onto the other side, ripping a decent-sized hole, as the enemy ship launched sideways before exploding in a bowl of plasma. Cheers erupted from the crew, but it was short-lived, as the enemy returned fire, and even more UNSC cruisers became victims to the Covenant's deadly weapons. Flank speed to 230 by 050, dodge. The ship lurched downwards before a sudden rumbling shook the frigate, and a sudden shrill alarm blasted across the bridge. Compartments 5 through 7 have been hit, cabins depressurizing. Lieutenant Ambrose alerted, bent the compartments, sealed the blast doors, and continue on course. Nikolai so ordered, and the captain silently thanked him, as a sudden grief filled his gut. Those compartments held nearly 2,000 marines preparing to head topside to fight the obviously grueling surface battles. Now they were to be tapped in the darkness of space. His chest tightened, and his eyes steeled, as he made a silent oath I will avenge your deaths. I swear it he turned his piercing gaze to his so, and noticed the same fire in his eyes. Prepare railgun stations. 
Aim 56 degrees by 39. Satine prepared firing solution to the lesser frigates manning the outer fleet. Full control of the secondary cannons. The AI flashed a moment and nodded before taking full reign of the secondary cannons. The 3,500-ton slugs launched out of their shafts faster than a blink before impacting the smaller frigates, their shields being overloaded by the first three before being ripped to shreds by another two. Bell guns primed and ready. The captain nodded to the lieutenant, and the salvos were launched without another hesitation. The mass accelerator stations launching 65000-ton slug rounds into a passing corvette, destroying its shields, and allowing the larger UNSC ships to lay waste into the smooth metal underneath. 20 kills to the UNSC, 33 casualties the teen reported, as she received the data from her fellow AIs. The captain grimaced, too many lost and gained, he thought. Sir incoming fire. The captain snapped up with wide and fearful eyes, as he had lost his focus, and suddenly a large blue ball impacted against the Hampton's hull, sending sparks flying, and destroying the left side of the ship. Archer pods G to J have been destroyed, hull breaches and compartments hell, nearly half the ship is depressurizing. Venting atmosphere, sealing blast doors, dear god. Dear god indeed, as it seems even with space sucking out all the air within the compartments, the bridge crew could still hear the agonizing screams of thousands of the ship's crew, as they were ripped out into space, and came to the horrifying realization that they had been sealed from salvation by the very ship they served in. Hull integrity at 46%, all hands lost on compartments 4 to 9 Sir Lieutenant Ambrose gulped audibly, as the word sunken in onto the crew. The ship, as small as it was, carried a force of 15,000 men, counting ship crew, but now carried only a scant 1,500 men. Those having been on the main launching bays at the bow of the ship kept them safe. Sir reported extra five Halcyon class cruisers were destroyed in the latest barrage, Satine informed, as she cast a sad gaze outside the bridge's broadside camera to see the bodies of several Marines and a few ODSTs floating nearby. Vice Admiral Cole is redirecting his fleet to the planet's moon, we're gonna do try a Theta Delta formation to spearhead through the enemy, Sir Satine watched, as all the color drained from her captain's face, as he stared at the woman in something akin to shock and horror. We'll lose half the fleet if we already lost half the fleet, Sir has so commented. He jumped slightly at the defeated tone of his so, ripping his gaze away from Satine the captain began pondering. He stared at his feet for a long silent moment, before he seemed to come to a decision no he said firmly, no more bloody cast a gaze towards each of his crew, before he landed his eyes on his awaiting so set course, to 340 by 079, surprise mirrored everyone on the bridge before understanding, and acceptance took form on their faces. I can't force this on any of you the captain, but was met with his crew's steely resolve, at that moment tears welled in the captain's eyes, as he bowed his head to them, it was an honor to have been your captain, the honor is all ours, sir the Zo replied. The captain, no, Nikolai Reznov nodded his head before issuing his final orders, transport all ground crews to the UNSC Falcon, and prepare for full speed towards set coordinates, informed Vice Admiral Cole, and set all secondary cannons to full stern railgun batteries are disturbed, and moved to the reactor. Prepare yourselves, this is the day we'll be remembered for, and ultimately forgotten. The ship's back thrusters came to life with a large roar, as they raced through the great expanse of space. Several of the Harvest Battle Group's warship began launching their Onager-class cannons into any nearby Covenant ship that was trying to impede it on the UNSC Hampton's course, towards the leading ship defending Harvest's orbit. All pelicans have been launched sir, several longswords are escorting them towards the UNSC Falcon. As per your orders, Satine made a small smile at the crew, who seemed relieved that they foot soldiers were out of the ship. Satine transfers himself to one of the UNSC ships, most preferably Vice Admiral Cole's flagship God knows he'd need you, the AI seemed reluctant, but ultimately nodded before she disappeared. Sir we're nearing the ship, sir has so reported, as the AI vanished from the podium for one last time. The captain straightened his back, as he stared proudly at his crew, his gaze not even once lingering on the looming Covenant ship he was about to destroy, instead opting to sear the faces of each and every single one of the naval officers into his brain, to make sure he would never forget them. Overload fusion reactors, set the ship to ramming speed, and goodbye. The next thing he saw was pure white followed by nothingness. The faint grumble of the slowly crumbling city did little to keep Naruto's spirits up, as he traversed through some of the many planes that dotted across harvest surface. Grimacing, as he passed by a group of mangled and burned corpses of civilians and UNSC troops alike, where the militia or marines had yet to discern, the blonde made sure to keep his eyes away. Damn taxpayers are just gonna love this, first a hundred dollar bump for oil, when the unis started showing up now what? A thousand dollar bump in buying a sticker Sima snorted after his mini rant, as he passed by several dead corpses of confirmed UNSC personnel. His little joker earned him a glare from Naruto and an eye roll from the females. They ripped right through them, the militia, and marines must have been gunning towards the barracks, damn unlucky bastard didn't even get the chance to blink before they were shredded, Seamus made sure to put in his usual battle, suave after every joke to keep both the girls, and Naruto, from chewing him up for his blatant disrespect for the dead. 
Naruto made a hand sign at the side of his helmet that signaled an all clear, while Catherine gave both Naruto and Sima a nod at their pieces of information. Catherine, Hammer's acting co had commandeered a pelican that was transporting them towards the UNSC Falcon, barely even reaching the halfway point before the red and black Spartan came towards the pilot and politely told him to back off from the controls. To say Vice Admiral Cole was a bit peeved at seeing the Spartans going topside without the assistance of UNSC Marines, and ODSTs was an understatement, the man was boiling, but more so from the fact that Catherine actually listed off a three-minute lecture of the advantages of having the Spartans on the ground, and the further bait of intel to supply the Marines who have yet touched the ground on what to expect, as well as playing on their special privileges given to them by Lord Hood. The Vice Admiral sucked it up and glowered at her after he listened to her logical and to the point detailed assessment and had to begrudgingly allow them to perform their appointed operation before performing their new task in both garnering intelligence and clearing a zone for the Marines and the UNSC Army to set up while the ODSTs began gearing for their drops in hostile areas of interest. The barracks should be a few clicks from here, Vivian keeps your sniper up for any Xenos the sniper acknowledges, with a wink of blue light on her helmet's left side before hoisting her rifle up and scanning the immediate area. Watching the Chief Petty Officer 2nd Class, Naruto, perform customary checks on both his MA-37 assault rifle and saw a strap to the magnetic strip on his back before shifting her gaze to the SPNKR wielding Irish member of her original fire team, the also blonde teen clipping on a flashlight to his BR-55 as night was fast approaching. She mused silently about their current objective. They were to assault a barracks designated the bar in remembrance to the fact that it used to be a university for law, a place that was shut down with near hysterical cheers from the populace, as one of them actually remarked in a news interview lawyers bring nothing but trouble, which proved true when the crime rate dropped by nearly 20%. The barracks was now a staging area for half of the Covenant forces within the planet. Alright Spartans let's move Catherine led the way for her teammates to follow, her sandy brown hair tucked neatly into her helmet. She was some of the few female Spartans who managed to keep her long hair through extensive threatening and swearing that even made the chief blush, the instructors had allowed it. Then follow your ugly ass, why the fuck not Naruto shook his head as the older male found himself getting smacked in the head by both females before they formed a loose formation to traverse through the Ashen remains of harvest. To the best of knowledge the Spartans had, the UNSC take a bath and the UNSC the Black Pearl with the destroyer the Queen Anne's Revenge were drifting towards the planet's atmosphere in preparation for the invasion to retake the planet which gave them a limited window to work their Spartan magic. The Spartans leapfrogged their way across the streets making sharp turns left and right before they had appeared on the street block in front of the university turned military facility. Catherine forced her Spartans into a duck when a sudden clicking noise alerted them to the presence of Xenos, and they watched quietly, as suddenly a group of bird-like creatures began hopping off from the rooftops, the action striking Naruto, as familiar, before dropping to street level. One of them gave several clicks, and the others nodded possible leader Catherine thought. She made several hand signs, and the two males nodded before breaking off to take flanking positions on the alien sides. She gave Vivian a look through her helmet, and the sniper nodded before popping out of cover, and trained the gun on the first bird, later being known as a skirmisher, before squeezing the trigger, and killing the thing. At the sound of the SR-99 ringing onto the battlefield, the Irish promptly jumped up from his place, and fired a steady burst from his BR-55 into the skirmisher's ranks, Naruto further confusing them by firing high-velocity rounds from his MA-37 to distract the birds. They twisted and turned every which way trying to figure out what was happening before realizing far too late to do anything. The last skirmisher could only squawk in shock as an armored fist slammed into his face and broke every bone painfully. Disgusting Seamus tried to wipe the purple blood onto Naruto's all orange with black stripes armor but got shoved away in retaliation. Keep your hands to yourself MB the green with white stripes. Spartan gave the other blonde the one fingered salute before wiping his hand on one of the dead aliens. Vivian, the silver and grey Spartan with several optical attachments to her helmet, giggled slightly at the boy's antics. Really now I would have thought Miranda and Lilith would have knocked those habits from the both of you, both males groaned as they tried to scoot away from the female, as possible, Naruto not wanting a reminder that he was still figuring out his relationship with Miranda, and Sima still stuck on the I'm an older brother figure mincet. You guys just need to drop your axe and tie the knot already Catherine grinned wickedly from her spot next to the sniper, a certain slyness in her voice that caused both Spartans to cast wary glances her way. I can always make it in order. At the looks of horror passing by the two males faces, she hummed in slight amusement before stalking off towards the university. Trackers aren't picking up any more contacts, probably a patrol we went and killed, so her element of surprise probably got shot to hell she remarked, lifting her own rifle up high enough to show the jokes were aside for now. I'm guessing another 10 maybe 15 minutes before the enemy releases these guys fail to check up, assuming they follow the same protocols Naruto added in, his tactical training showing itself in a confident monotone that would make the chief proud. 
Then we either book it, or we split, and take out four fronts at the same time. Catherine rubbed the bottom of her helmet in silent contemplation, her highly augmented brain running through as many scenarios as possible to try, and find the best solution. We book it, stay together, and keep a tight formation. We're dealing with energy weapons instead of projectile weapons, so we stick together until we get a good assessment on their combat abilities. Hammer team nodded at her order, and they formed their line again, Vivian on the front, Catherine on the center with Naruto, and Seamus on the rear guard. Keep a tight line, Quinfiti me was so bored. In fact he was bored enough to sing battle poems with the fumed Alec Golo on the bass, and that in itself was utterly boring. The young miner sighed, as he set his mandibles shut with a hiss. He scanned through the barren wasteland he was watching guard over with nearly droopy eyes, before he noticed something in his peripheral vision. The Singhali miner growled something low underneath his breath, as his hands clutched the Covenant plasma rifle tighter. When his motion tracker started to ping, Quenfitimi twisted around with a loud roar, but suddenly felt a sudden need to yelp in pain when he found himself on the ground with the butt of a carbine stuffed underneath his chin. Poor Quen, you would think that since you joined the ranks that your skills would have improved. The miner glared at the other fellow Singhali above him, a stealth major who went by the name of Wayne Quit Me. But I would ask that you kindly lift yourself from me, Quinn started in a very respectful tone of voice, or I'll shove my rifle in a place where the sun doesn't shine growled. The stealth major snorted at his blatant threat, not at all worried if he would act upon it, before none too gently pushing himself up from the down Singhali. You should know better than to use such a tone with the superior Quen, it burns your honor, and the honor of your clan. Quen seemed to scoff, dusting himself off from any dirt or grime before clicking his mandibles in agitation. I could say the same to you, I saw your discomfort when the prophets bestowed us the honor of exterminating these vermin from existence. Quen gave the other Singhali a searching look, noticing the slight narrowed eyes that he carried. Wyan gave the young miner a contemplative look before managing slowly I do believe that heretics are deserving of such a fate, as this Wyan allowed, however I do believe that heretics are judged upon action seen rather than heard when eyes grew, as hard, as steel when he mentioned this, quietly apologizing for the lives, the innocent lives he had killed not too long ago. Prophets be damned. There was no honor in this. There was no great journey from this. There was no redemption from the sins he had committed on this day. Queen gave the older male a skeptical look before shaking his head free of any heretic thoughts. As you wish Wayne, I will continue my duties now. We may speak on a later date. With a series of clicks and farewell, the miner walked away to his next position. A stealth major watched him go for a silent contemplative moment, before he noticed a group of four large humanoid-shaped forms marching across the plains at a speed that rivaled the Singhali. Wayne grinned to himself, the miner would be safe from them, and he was sure, as the forerunner divinity, that he wasn't gonna be anywhere near the base when those humans assaulted it. As I've heard some humans say, payback a bitch his mandibles flared to life before he cloaked, allowing the light to bend, and twist around him before he disappeared almost entirely. As if on cue, there were plentiful large explosions ringing through the base, as sirens and alarms began blaring. The Singhali began humming a battle poem, as he stalked away from the base's main walls. Naruto rounded his MA-37 into one of the split jaws that were currently trying to rush him, and his siblings. Letting loose a stream of bullets, the Spartan was only mildly annoyed with the shielding that covered it before it sparked out of existence, and his bullets were allowed to lay waste into the organic underneath. The blonde teen cast a glance over his shoulder to see Vivian pull her sniper rifle up, and firing it off into several split jaws rounding a corner. She wasn't as good a shot as Linda, but was still second if not on par with Fred. Come on. Let me see those pearly whites. The Spartan grimaced, as he watched his other male members use his combat knife to slice through one of the split jaw's mandibles, stowing the organic piece into his back pouch to send to Halsey. The Spartan then shoved the knife into the split jaw's head, spewing brain matter and blood before firing his BR-55 from the hip into a group of those tiny pudgy reptiles that the group unanimously decided to call grunts. Some of them even fainted before the bullets reached them. Catherine was next to him, and the female was currently maintaining a tactical uplink with the rest of the squad while in combat to help coordinate their offensive, and not so easy feat. Seamus moved up to that crate. Vivian covers fire, Naruto suppresses. The blonde nodded without hesitation, as he popped out of cover, and unloaded his saw machine gun rifle into the alien ranks, allowing the Irish descendant to roll into cover behind a crate, and prime a hand grenade. With a brief wink of his warning lights, the Spartan 2 launched the grenade out before ripping his SPNKR out. Satisfied when he heard his explosive go boom followed by several cries, Seamus popped up under the cover of both Vivian's and Naruto's field of fire, as he aimed his rocket launched a group of mainly split jaws, one of them dressed in an ornate red and gold type of armor that screamed I be leader, you bullied me to death. Letting the rocket fly, the Irish didn't even wait to see if it did any damage before pulling his BR back out, and skillfully start to wither down the remaining Zenos nearby, faintly noticing Naruto move up to a position nearer to him, before he let another salvo from Sora turn to the battlefield with a vengeance. Spartans break off, Seamus takes care of stragglers, Viv you assist, Naruto you're on me, 
The Spartans only made brief acknowledgements before they went to their tasks, shifting to form their new two-man cells, as they performed their objectives. With Vivian and Seamus killing the remaining Xenos, Naruto and Catherine were moving into the university, the blonde wincing every now and again, as something started to bubble in his stomach area. Should I forgot to take my meds he thought grimly. Catherine, where are we going? Naruto questioned, as they cleared past other hallways. The female didn't respond verbally, instead opting to pull something out of her back compartment to show Naruto. His reaction was very comical. The Spartan lost his footing before it began skidding against the floor, thanks to his augmented speed, his helmeted visor slamming painfully into a receptionist's desk. The leader of Hammer Team chortled at the scene for a moment before setting her jaw firm. We're gonna detonate a Havoc nuclear bomb in the middle of Naruto. The girl smiled sweetly behind her mask, and the blonde could help, but gulped in something akin to fear. Naruto really wasn't sure what the hell was going on anymore at that point, the only thing he could properly compute was Catherine gripping his leg, and dragging him off deeper into the university. Come on Shimata I bet Miranda would at least not look like a girl in the armor. Eh yeah, well he was pretty sure he at least looked like a hot girl in the armor. Saren bit down on her pencil agitatedly, as she slouched against the soft cushion of her wheelchair. A tired sigh escaped her lips while she absent-mindedly played with the blanket on top of her legs. The young woman took a moment to observe her surroundings slightly, from the whitewashed walls to the empty, and near-abandoned atmosphere of the base. Only Castle Safehouse was nothing of its former bustling self. Most of the scientists and security personnel had gone home for their off-duty shift, while some of the usual overtime workers had decided to put in some extra time with their families. So, as it stood, the Spartan washout was as close to being alone since her first days of being a street rat. She pursed her lips when she suddenly remembered that she wasn't all alone. Dr. Halsey was currently in a meeting with a few of Oni top commanders, some of the most thieving and untrustworthy bunch she had ever had the pleasure to breathe with. The young female shuddered in sympathy to the older woman who had to listen to those big-headed assholes, and one female by the name of Parangaski. The older paranoid-induced female was literally giving everything from a living, breathing human being to a pebble, a distrustful look. A moment of contemplation was interrupted when a sudden bout of static rushed out of her communications instruments. Oni command this is goal 2, um this is goal 2 Saren smiled slightly when she heard a timid voice go through, as she was going by voice alone, she was pretty sure the young female on the other end, was digging her heel into the dirt. It's okay Lila that's me Saren smiled into the transfer. There were few in the Spartan ranks who could deviate from their military taught core, even those that break it in a regular basis were strict in its use within the presence of other high ranking officials, but for the soft spoken and shy female on the other line, Saren was willing to break it just for her. Oh Saren, it's good to hear you there was an audible sigh of relief on the other side. Um 323 has asked me to relay to you that the UNSC Powderhound is en route to the white border. Saren nodded her head as she noted that down onto a pad she kept in handy near her. The white border was what the UNSC termed the area around the inner colonies and the outer colonies. It was strictly regarded as neutral, though it has housed many Earth forces in the past. The standing governors and presidents of the worlds in question had always argued that so long as the Earth show no aggression to them, and same goes to the UNSC, then they had no qualms with harboring members of their factions. Thank you for the update Saren, send Jorge my regards. She smiled a bit when she got an eep, as a response before the other line disappeared, no doubt Jorge having caught the tail end of the conversation. Her grin faltered slightly when she noticed the crosses all across her now choked pad. Several reports from the other Spartan teams showed the same results, all of them were on the run to the white border, each arriving on a set time, and Saren had the inkling suspicion that the UNSC was planning something she could simply hypothesize about. Her brow nearly slammed against each other until the timely intervention of a dry monotone boomed from the transfer Oni command. This is blue actual reporting complete mission success, and the deactivation of Covenant Corvette over Saren nearly jumped out of her wheelchair when she recognized the voice and suppressed a wince after her legs began groaning in protest to the sudden motion. Blue actual this is Oni command transmission received please hold for further orders. Saren pulled out a roster pad and flipped a nearby station in order to reassign the team of Spartans to a proper area of combat. Scrolling past several unneeded stations and backorder worlds, she removed a stack of data pads from one of Halsey's stashes and began multitasking the search through already dispatched Spartan teams to those on standby aboard UNSC ships were on reach, before finally stopping on a suitable relocation. Blue Actual This is Oni Command The UNSC Destroyer Titan is currently en route to your location, report to ship captain, and await further orders. He'll be contacted shortly, John made an affirmative before the calm line retreated back into silence.
Just when Saren was about to rest her back on her wheelchair again the Spartan's voice returned sharply. Where is the location of Hammer 4 Saren frowned when she heard the inquiry, hands dancing on her instruments to try and find the ripe blonde before nearly crying out in triumph, which was admittedly squashed when she got a good long look at it. He's currently stationed with the Harvest Battle Group on Harvest. No further contact has been made yet. After Vice Admiral Cole reported arrival on the system, there was a frown on Saren's face as she continued to read through latest reports before finally she returned her steady gaze onto the trans of her. May I ask why you want to know? It's time for Naruto's medication Saren's mind stalled, and her hand froze in midair, as she tried to process what was said. She reeled back in both disgust and horror. When the implications hit her oh shit she swore, her hand slapped against her wheels harshly, before the female wheeled herself to a nearby terminal to access individual Spartan armors. Quickly pushing in the codes for Naruto's the young woman was dismayed to see that the Mjolnir medical systems reported no new chemicals, having been introduced into the blonde system. Frag at all she cursed in a variety of other child-friendly and other not-so-friendly words before returning to the transiver the damnable idiot hasn't taken his meds, if that's what you're asking for her eyes nearly watered. As she thought about the consequences, her back shuddering in fright at what the blonde could would do when it wanted out again. It was a worried sign on the other side, like she had confirmed what he already knew before the Spartan began again I see, well damn it all to hell, Saren smiled ruefully at hearing the normally collected male start swearing, we better pray he's nowhere near friendlies, and somewhere close to enemies, because if only gets whiff of this it'll be his ass, and our ass is on the line since we have to hold him away from white coats, the young female grunted in either annoyance or worry for her sibling, before cupping her face with her hands, damn idiot can't be easy, can he there was a scoff on the other line before it cut abruptly, and the female was alone again. She grimaced oddly, as memories of what happened floated by her eyes before she shook them away. Wheeling back to her previous station she pulled out Naruto's armor specs again, and bit her lower lip. With hesitant hands she inputted a code into the computer acknowledged. Lockdown procedure X341 in effect, trigger on standby the armor system replied automatically. The female suddenly felt old weariness fill her gut when the message popped up before resigning herself to simply tear her hair out. Naruto, unaware of what had been done to his armor, continued to plow his way through the Covenant ranks, as they tried to reach Catherine, who was currently setting up a bomb in the middle of the university. The blonde ducked and rolled across two of the split jaw swings, before bringing the butt of his gun up and smacking the thing by its head. Satisfied when he heard the crunch of bones and splatter of brain matter, he pulled out his saw and wielded it one-handed, as he let out a decent spray of bullets down the hallways, clipping through grunts and scathing some other split jaws. I would appreciate it if you hurry up Catherine Naruto bit out, as he felt a stinging burn on his left underside. The Mjolnir was capable of deflecting and absorbing the plasma hits he had received, but nonetheless it couldn't hold back forever. There was probably a decent sized burn mark there now. I'm trying, but if you want I can just manually blow this up. Kill us all with these zealous right on the start of the war, Naruto snorted at her irritated tone, as he dodged more plasma shots for his head, well I'm the one getting shot at right now, so hurry up, or I'm purposely letting two or three get past me, he retorted before slinking down against the wall he took cover behind, and primed a fragmentation grenade, I mean it's not like I enjoy getting shot at you know, tossing the grenade over his shoulder the blonde rolled away just, as an explosions happened, several of the grunts methane pack exploding, and sending them airborne. Ugh, and I think my filters are broken. Naruto made a disgusted face when the smell of the gas leaked into his helmet. Slightly gagging from it the blonde reloaded his MA-37, while propping his saw against the wall. Slamming a fresh clip home Naruto repositioned himself to a better location. Quit complaining to Naruto geez if Miranda was here she'd be laughing at her. As Naruto grinned to himself when he heard an annoyed huff on the other end. Oh he was going to get it later, but the opportunity was too good to pass up. He maintained his upbeat mood, as he continued to cut, and gun his way across the several remaining Covenant forces rushing him. But his eyes were far cry to how he acted, he was literally panicking, as he kept a steady eye on his medical systems. Increased heart rate, shutdown of advanced brain functions, while adding pressure on primitive survival functions, increase in temperature, and a higher motor function activity, were all consistent symptoms to state that the blonde just didn't want to happen now of all times. Come on Furball, we talked about this. Naruto gritted his teeth when he slammed a grunt into the wall, suddenly receiving enjoyment at its death when its neck snapped and its head lolled to the side. Come on. Don't play with my head. The blonde blocked a strike from a split jaw before impacting his fist against his chest, not at all surprised when his hand went through the cavity and appeared on the other side, blazing a faint bit of red. Yes stop you idiot the Spartan dropped to a knee when he felt his canines grow and his face contorting uncontrollably into animalistic rage. I went out. The cry rang out into his head like a ball of lead, and he suppressed the wince when he was forced to drop his gun to cup his ears. I demand freedom. Naruto tried to stand back up, but felt his legs give way again. You humans never learn. The ground seemed to quake for the blind, as the voice grew more angrier, more animalistic, and strangely more philosophical. 
All you know is horror. All you know is pain. Even when the creators gave a light, you forced it away. I am no prisoner you may use. I am no weapon for your perverse whores. I will not be trapped in you. I don't want you either. Naruto collapsed, as his armor roared out a klaxon in his head. Warning, warning, chemical residue C21 detected protocol X341 initiated prepare for full armor lockdown. That was the last thing he heard before he was forcibly knocked unconscious. Naruto scowled when he found himself in familiar murky sewer water. Pushing himself up he was further unsurprised to see he was wearing his old military regulations PT gear. The blonde splashed against the water irritably before venturing deep within the cavern of his mindscape. It was always odd for him when he saw the place, so alike with years of abuse showing in its cracks and dents, it both alarmed and humbled the blonde to see the place, as it was, showing his heart passed within the confines of his Spartan training. But even with low-level maintenance done to the place, there was a certain spark in the hallways, a couple flowers growing here and there, and a book or two detailing fond moments of his time protruding out of a crack that showed him that his childhood wasn't all too bad. The winding walks of misdirections and dead ends didn't really stop Naruto, the blonde always wondered how he knew where everything was, even if this was most likely his third time there. It was a final heavy sigh when the blonde reached a pair of double barred gates, annoyance flashing in his eyes, as he stared at the titanium prison that both interrupted his thoughts, and housed the subject of his thoughts. Right where his glare was planted a giant, if not slightly intimidating, figure of a nine-tailed fox creeped from the shadows with a near-alarming smile. The fox glared at the blonde, as he began banging its head against the steel. We need to have this talk the blonde tried to sound reasonable, but the fox merely sneered at his general direction, baring his fangs, and stretching his claws in preparation of ripping the blonde male into tiny little microscopic pieces. Where do you hate humans? Do you not wish me gone? All the same, seeking power, and death for whatever purpose or reason, your very existence is testament to that I assure. Naruto, I am trapped in your infernal body. And I didn't want you. The blonde roared back just as fiercely, meeting Fox's unflinching gaze with one of his own. After a while the blonde gave off a thoughtful snort, teeth gnashing against each other in agitation. Well no more of this, I'm putting my foot down. The fox raised a single delicate eyebrow before the blonde continued before he could interrupt, yeah I get it you don't like me, and I sure, as hell don't like, but, as it stood I didn't ask for this, and I'm sure, as hell no you didn't too, we're force acquaintances that want nothing to do with the other, I know this. The fox stretched his teeth back while other bouts of retorts were beginning to form in his throat. But damn it all, stop pushing all of you damn hate on me. Stop trying to call me out on hating you, on using you or on trapping you. I didn't do shit, and I personally don't hate you. At the fox quizzical look the blonde elaborated, your reaction is no different to a caged animal, and admittedly human. You wanted out, and you resorted to banging, and clawing which in this case led to the incident you may have harmed my siblings, but you were made this way, and I surely can't bite back my words on mother nature. The blonde huffed annoyedly at the fox, I honestly don't hate you, nor do I like you, but the blonde drifted off slightly remembering words both Mendes and Halsey gave him when an unknown is either an enemy or a friend work him, as a friend before labeling him, as an enemy. The Spartan gave the appointed look, when that softened marginally, I honestly hold no ill to you, chief, and mom taught me too much to do that, and I honestly can't blame you, but damn it all you chose a bad time to come knowing on my door. The fox was now lying on his front paws, quietly listening, as the human in front of him went on with his troll. If anything I wouldn't mind you being my friend, but I doubt you'd be willing for that relationship. The fox snorted at the Spartan, eyes narrowing like a conniving rat before biting out harshly. I have no reason to trust your lies. The Spartan was silent in a moment before he finally sighed, forgive me, then that sentence caught the fox in a circle, as suddenly a sentence played out in his mind, forgive me Kayubi. I guess I'm just not ready to face you yet, I suppose that's my undoing with keeping it silent for so long. The blonde gave the fox a hard expression before seemingly nodding to himself, as if he reached a decision well, I guess there's next time the fox reeled back in disgust at the human before him, next time, yes next time, I'm not stopping until you can at least have a friendly conversation with me. The blonde shrugged his shoulders a bit before stalking back the way he came. When the boy was out of sight the fox couldn't help, but let out a half snort at the blonde disappearance from the mindscape. Well fuck my moral processors. One sniffed slightly when he saw the green with white stripes, an armored human began gutting his way through several Singhali swordsmen, with near precise jabs, and thrusts that left most crippled or dead. His eyes were nearly bulging from its nest on his scope when he saw the white and gray human aimed her sniper on an elite through a wall. He clicked his mandibles, he wasn't so impressed, as his own kind could do that, as well, but he was partially sure the feat would have been impressive for a human. He shifted his stance, and aimed his gaze into the university where he saw the red and black human finishing up on her bomb. He took several contemplative steps back, uneasy with the idea of a bomb a few dozen meters from his position. A series of short HMMPHS and Craig GHW caught behind him, and a stealth major manipulated his mandibles into a sharp frown. 
he kicked against a bundle of limbs and ropes behind painfully, hissing a quiet silence before returning his sights back onto the university, all the while ignoring the glare sent to him by the irate miner tied up underneath his feet. Dear God that sounded wrong. The withering glare only intensified when Wyan began snickering to himself oh shush. I just saved you from a premature and useless death. And before you start spouting nonsense about your honor. I say you this stylo gelf that shut the miner up good. Albeit with a couple gurgling noises and curses. But nonetheless he remained quiet. Wyan bristled slightly when he heard a muffled honorless arse drift into his ear. And repositioned his sniper to peer at the humans again for another moment. But recoiled back in shock when the grey and white one was aiming her sniper rifle directly at him. There was a tense stance still between them, Wyan's intake of breath held, while the human remained standing completely still, while appearing nonplussed to the explosions happening behind her. A few short seconds ticked by before finally she moved, faster than his eyes could track the human, lowered her sniper rifle, and gave him a strange hand gesture of two fingers up in a V, before turning her back to him, and stalking away. Wyan blinked his eyes down at what he just saw, and he heard Quen finally snap the bindings around his mandibles to allow for speech. Has a development occurred? He asked when he saw the flared mandibles his captor had. Wyan blinked down at him blearily before he clicked his mandibles together I have no idea. He didn't just flash him the peace sign, did you? Seamus's incredulous voice nearly caused Vivian to giggle, as she pulled her M6G out to take a grunt or two that were too close for her sniper rifle, but far enough that she could just swap them away. While they were being rather peaceful, just watching us even, as we killed their brethren, so either they're deserters or they don't agree with this war, enough to actually die for it, Vivian's reasoning was logical, but Seamus had to stomp down on it, or they were ordered to observe to get an assessment on our capabilities. Vivian bristled at that notion, sidestepping a clumsy strike by a skirmisher before burying her heel into his gut deep enough to break his bones, and pulverizing its guts before flicking it off her foot with disgust. I severely doubt that Seamus just snorted on the other end, but remained quiet to the situation, as he dealt with another set of split jaws, now nicknamed elites, due to the difficulty in combat of dealing with them compared to the others. These guys are relentless aren't they? Vivian like most Spartans were taught, was measuring this in a completely militaristic standpoint, if the enemy was so willing to send so much of their troops to slaughter, it shows either a, they are very devoted, b, they have the men to spare, which is worrying, or c, they were idiots. C was out the window thanks to their technology that they wielded, A and B could both be true, as they were committing genocide due to their religion, and that would be only logical reason why they seem to be undaunted with the loss of lives. I'm sure Chief has a long and winded lecture about this somewhere in his head, Vivian cracked a smile, as she pulled the trigger for her rifle, allowing the bullet to sail through the bodies of two skirmishers, and an elite before rounded back into cover to reload her gun. And I'm sure Keith would follow up with stories of his academy days, that earned her a snort of amusement from the Irish male, as he crushed two jackal hats together, damn we got a weird group of people to call family ha. Huh? Before Vivian could reply her armor system started screaming out warnings, and reports, as they began blaring alert, alert, Hammer 4 is experiencing major trauma, and advanced motor function failure. Repeat protocol X341 has been initiated. She nearly dropped her gun in shock, and if it weren't for the timely intervention of Seamus BR, she would have gotten a rather nasty hit to the helmet. Damn. I don't want to go through that again. He muttered, as he slammed a new clip into his BR, and palmed his extra magazines anxiously, Vivian doing the same thing, except she was fiddling with her cuckery knife to seek comfort. If he is coming out to play she turned wary eyes towards Seamus, who nodded back with some level of fearful hesitation, then he's coming out to play the Irish activated his calm link, and was less than surprised to hear Catherine's distress voice on the other end, shit. Viv, Seamus get your tails here, I'm trapped in the center of the university with Covenant troops, and I really don't want to get caught in a corner when he comes out. He sent his acknowledgement towards Catherine's helmet before snapping the latch to his BR back. Time to head in the woods again Vivian grimaced at his bad attempt in irony, as her mind was forcibly returned to the night in the woods. But before she could properly lose herself, Seamus lightly shook her awake, Sake Viv, I'm sure Naruto won't let him hurt us too bad like last time. She nodded her head before following Seamus out of the open, and into the innards of the university, keeping sharp eyes focused on the present rather than the past. She just really didn't want to see it again. Such a scared and frail girl, her back shivered before she squashed her fear. The walls nearly melted away, as the red aura surrounded, and enveloped Naruto's body, splashing against him, and wrapping around him. The red cloak tried to burn the armor around him, but instead opted to turn the suit into an extra layer of protection. Parting the steel, and infusing it with its entire essence before it stilled, the heat died down until only a soft sizzle was heard, and Naruto stood up with brief snaps of disgruntled bones. Well at least I'm not on a rampage. The blonde frowned to himself when he heard his distorted voice, filled with rage and hatred that nearly caused him to raise his gun and yell he's there. The Spartan whirled around when he heard gunshots on the other end. Taking a step forward the male winced when he felt his legs protest to the movement, still trying to adapt to the new power circulating him like a drug. He's up for a bowl or I'm coming back in there. 
In an act of defiance or utter boredom, the furball didn't ease up, instead sending more chakra into the boy's body, trying to take over, and making sure he couldn't fight back. It seems that the early talk had no effect on him. Naruto gritted his teeth, but nonetheless continued to step forward. He had a duty, a responsibility to his team to keep fighting, and he'd be damned if he just lied down and gave up. The foreign chakra continued to burn his body and wrap around him, while the visage of a fox began forming. Dark red ears protruded out at the top of his dark orange helmet, while red claws grew from the fingertips of his gloves. A single blood crimson tail manifested itself from the end of his spinal cord, while two white glowing eyes appeared right where his eyes should be over the gold reflective mirror. Damn I wish I had a picture to show you. The few moments of human clarity that Naruto had was suddenly shutting down, as the more primal instincts began pushing itself to the front. He fell to the ground on all fours, as he lost grip on his control. He knew he had to warn his team, so using up his last reserves, he clicked his hand over his team and winced, as the burning sensation increased Guy's watch for the fox. His brain promptly shut down, as the rush of instinctual rage became too much, and his mouth stretched back for a blood-curdling roar. There was only one thing in Naruto's mind now, one thing rage. Catherine was nearly hysterical, as she tried to cut her way through the covenant ranks. Having felt the atmosphere get flooded with such evil intent, that she was afraid to be there. She had only felt this once before, and she didn't want to go through it again. But she kept to her military core, and remained calm, as she hoped Vivian and Seamus would get there in time before Nehru got out again. She was about to eject her spent magazine when her hand froze, and her eyes widened in fear, as a roar echoed off the halls around the university. The elites paused, their mandibles clicking, as they began making short guttural growls, it seemed, as though they were accepting a challenge, as some strapped their guns behind their backs, and pulled out several of their energy swords, while others ducked lower to the ground, with their plasma rifles primed, and ready. A series of clicks was heard, as the elites spread their feet apart to meet the challenger, and Catherine was sorely tempted to bolt, as their attention was diverted from her, but before she could take the opportunity a loud thud, and a splash was heard. Almost like a signal, everything else that happened was nothing short of hell. The two Spartans that had been given the cleanup duty, were now racing past the hallways of the university, using every ounce of their superhuman speed. Having caught their teammates warning the two of them were now bolting across the turns and curves with reckless abandon, as they tried to reach Catherine's position. They knew all three of them would be no match against Nerit, but they would be enough to slow it down, before it could do any damage to anybody, but the enemy. They nearly shivered, and froze in fear when they felt the killing intent, but having experienced it once before they gulped it down, and kept pushing their powerful legs forward. When they rounded a corner Seamus's eyes widened, and he quickly clamped down onto Vivian's shoulder get down. He yelled before he forced the girl onto the ground, as an elite, his mandibles flared open in shock, as if he was trying to come to grips with what had happened, flew over their heads, and began slamming against the farthest wall with a sickening crunch, and splat. The Irish-born raised his head long enough to see Naruto, complete with his crimson fox cloak over the Mjolnir armor, start to rip through elites with his sharp claws, and swat them away with his tail. He rested a hand against Vivian's back, as the possessed blonde had yet to see them. Sneaky whispered, and she nodded her head, as they melted into the few shadows that dotted the hallways, keeping themselves hidden from their friend, as they tried to find their co. They found her alright, on the ground, and cradling her arm, the armor around having melted, and the gun beneath her feet a smoldering pile of ash. Kath Vivian was the first to have reached her friend, while Seamus was at the back, his BR raised, and trained on Naruto in case the other blondes saw them. What happened? Catherine tried to snort, but winced, and instead opted to simply sigh. He came at the Elise first, plowing through them like they weren't there before he decided I was a better hunt, I hit him a few times, but he shrugged it off, and nearly broke my arm off she gripped her abused arm for a moment before sighing in relief, as her armor injected painkiller into her system, shouldn't his armor systems have locked him down. Seamus grimaced behind Vivian, catching the two females' attention, they couldn't see the grimace much more than they had felt it. His armor is locked down, look. Catherine turned her gaze to Naruto just when he ripped the mandibles off from one of the elites, and used it as a blade to cut through his neck. Grimacing, she noticed a faint gold hue underneath the armor, damn it all she cursed. She turned her sights onto Seamus, and the male nodded, got it Viv get Kath out of here, I'll hold off Naruto till he can get the thing in control. Vivian looked like she wanted to protest, but was met with a stern glare from her co. She sighed and relented, picking the red and black Spartan up and retreating to another exit out of the university. The silent good luck and Seamus was preparing his SPNKR and several small cubes of C12 while mentally counting down the remaining elites that unwittingly bought him a few minutes of time. Breathing a huge breath the Irish slammed a fresh clip into his BR and rounded out of cover with a flurry of speed. Alright Nar, it's time we had our spar. Your Spartans are property of the Office of Naval Intelligence Drive Halsey, and you will do well to remember that Halsey gave the Oni officer a dirty look, as she unloaded all of her hatred onto him. And you will do well to remember that my Spartans are my creations, I made them what they are, and you have no right to tell me what to do with them. 
I'll see be reasonable the covenant threat is growing larger than what we can possibly imagine. We must put into production more candidates, so as to have a better means of combating the enemy. Halsey grew increasingly frustrated at Oni's attempts in getting her to create a second class of Spartans, something she will not do no matter what happens. The Spartan units we already have are sufficient enough, and the likelihood of any more children with enough green light for candidacy is still few, and far between. Candidacy is not a problem for us Dr. Halsey, we would merely take what is needed, and mold them into the Spartans necessary to combat the Covenant, Paranguski replied icily. The blonde scientist glared heatedly at the Oni head. You would risk the innocent lives of children to make defective Spartans that can point a gun and shoot at a technologically superior alien hegemony. The Oni head bristled at her accusation. Yes I would, and for the one who has already risked innocent children's lives, that is quite hypocritical of you. Halsey glowered at her, hands twitching underneath the desk to try and make a grab for her throat. The woman was really getting on her nerves. More than that actually, she was putting the lives of her Spartans on the line, and that did more than just piss her off. I get to decide the repercussions of my actions Paranguski, only me or my Spartans can, so don't raise yourself on such a high pedestal. Paranguski returned her glare with one of her own, and just like that the unfortunate male members of Oni's head of staff were caught in between the crossfires of hell. Saren watched with a myriad of emotions on her face. Anger at the Oni head, pride at Halsey, anger at the Oni head, love at Halsey, and varying levels of pity for the males. But having lived with Seamus of all people, well, that pity disappeared faster than a bowl of ramen near Naruto. Which was really fast. Oni's planning something. She crossed her arms over her chest, and leaned her back against the wheelchair padding. It was only natural she came to that conclusion. Serving in Oni's castle base had left her with many options to sate her boredom. The most popular of those options were watching all those nasty secrets Oni tried to hide from her hacking skills. They wouldn't be so adamant about a second class of Spartans when the Covenant had just entered the playing field. Granted they were technologically superior. Furthermore, if they really wanted the Spartans so badly they wouldn't seek permission from Halsey. There was something missing in the picture, and she intended to find out what. But then again turning to her side terminal, and listening to the loud blares, she couldn't help but be driven to another problem. Warning warning X341 initiated. Warning warning warning. Slapping her hands onto her face she sighed to herself in despair. Naruto you better get it under control or you force my hand. She really didn't really want to use that measure out of all the measures, but she didn't have a choice in the matter. If she had to keep her fellow Spartans safe through this, then she'd do it without a hint of regret, but with a heart full of remorse. Seema dodged Naruto's clawed fist in time to round his BR up and into the beast man's gut. The bullets, as he had expected, simply melted upon touch or were blocked by the Mjolnir armor underneath. Either way the Irish male felt as if he was caught in a very hard place. Like in between an open women's shower room and locker room, good at face value, bad when all the women were Spartans. Naruto, I'm afraid I have to call a foul in our spar. Seamus found his words rewarded with a tail impacting against his gut. Thankfully, Dr. Halsey had felt it prudent to make sure the Mjolnir armor could withstand the acidic effect of Naruto's cloak which is a double-edged sword when Naruto is now wearing the armor underneath the cloak. And the Irish instead felt a ribs or two crack under the pressure. Vivian is gonna torque you if you kill me. In a moment of stunned awe, Naruto seemed to hesitate, as he raised his fist back to try and slam it against Seamus another time. His eyes were enlarging from side to side, as if just beginning to realize this little tidbit of information. Naruto scanned him again, then to the dead elites lying in strewn pieces on the floor, and shrugged. An international gesture of whatever. Seamus, instead of feeling fear, felt a brief tang of jealousy if he had a baddest cloak he didn't need to worry about getting killed by feminine fury, and made to voice it, that's just not fair, and you know that Naruto's first impacted against Seamus's head, and a web of cracks spread through his gold visor. Immediately after survival instincts took over, and Mendez's mandate of survive at all costs kicked in. Seamus grabbed Naruto by his wrist, and using every bit of his augmented strength, was capable of lifting Naruto over his shoulder, and crashing amidst the elite corpses on the ground. Seamus dropped to the ground on his back, and trained his BR in Naruto's direction. The controlled Naruto responded with dodges, and jumped up, and across the university courtyard. Single tail swishing, as if to control his flight. You better get out before Saren decides to blow our armor Seamus grunted, and felt a sudden heat spread across his body. Oh you son of a a torrent of fire was launched towards Seamus, and the Irish were forced to roll into cover, and pull out his SPNKR rocket launcher. If I had a penny with how many times I got burned he muttered under his breath. Seamus rounded out of cover and, to his immense surprise, found Naruto perched right above his head, eyes piercing down on him in fascination. What are you? A bat. Seamus brought his SPNKR to bear, and without second thought launched the bolt. What happened next was really his fault. Obviously Naruto dodged the rocket however the rocket impacted against the ceiling and exploded, the ceiling falling to the ground and trying to crush Seamus. 
The Spartan jumped out of the way, but unwilling into a pillar, and instead of banging and sliding down from the pillar, he went to causing the ceiling to become even more unstable, and another section of the ceiling fell down. Perhaps the bomb was unneeded after all. Naruto watched the destruction absent-mindedly, as Seamus cursed in various different languages. The Irish turned to Naruto to see him quietly laughing at his misfortune. Indeed he was covered in, and with the dents, and cracks all across his armor from the fight with Naruto, he looked like a half-broken statue with a rocket, and a mean temper. Fuck you. He cursed. Seamus aimed the rocket, and let another one loose, but Naruto flashed out, and reappeared inches from the Irish male's face. Fuck me. He reiterated when he found another claw slapping against his face, sending him tumbling into the ground. Kayubi Naruto tried to grapple Seamus, but the Irish was fast enough to reverse the grip, and brought Naruto down onto the ground. The Irish Spartan was forced to reevaluate his current predicament. Considering the fact that he was the best hand-to-hand -hand specialist in the team, it was only logical that he would deal with Naruto when in this state, but in any other option, Seamus would have preferred John in his place, at least that guy wouldn't mind getting beaten up by Naruto. As it stood Seamus would barely get a good hold on the blonde to keep him still before he could reassert control. God damn it what are you doing in there? Inside Naruto Mindscape. Well after that John thought that I was joking, but then Wemu Vivian comes out of nowhere, and slams him to the ground. It was a home run hit if I ever saw one. Kayubi groaned, as he flattened his ears against his head, trying with all his might to shut the annoying blonde brat's voice from his mind. Aren't you going to shout at me, and try to get me to take back all my chakra? The nine-tailed fox roared, he'd have preferred shouting to stories of how human females were physically stronger than human males. Eh? But you said you can't do anything about it so it's pointless. The Kayubi slushed deeper into his cage, as the blonde stood up, mentally preparing himself for another round of stories. Besides you're just a big softie, so I'm sure my friends are okay. Now that rolled the fox up, faster than even Kali could run, the fox slammed his paw on Naruto's head, flattening the blonde against the water, and effectively causing him to whine pitifully to the bump in his head. Would you do that? Why would I go, as far as to insult one of my stature? The Kayubi retorted Naruto crossed his arms over his chest, and sulked quietly in a corner, but not before giving the fox Seamus his famous salute, and scooted, as far away from the cage, as possible. The fox watched a blonde, sweat dropping when he saw a rain cloud appear above his head, and effectively drowning him in water. Back with Saren, Saren was none too happy when she activated Seamus's helmet cam. With the distance between harvest and reach there was a delay between images, but even so she couldn't help, but flattened her face when she literally saw Naruto slapping Seamus across the face silly. Ow ow ow. Would you stop that? At least fight me like a man beast, thing. Saren's face only got flatter when Naruto obliged, and punched him through the university's windows, and against Vivian and Catherine who had just left the front door. Saren may have gone delusional at that point, but she was sure she saw one of the aliens staring at them through a sniper rifle. She couldn't help but feel bad for it. I'm turning on the safety measure. Saren clicked on several buttons, inserted a command into her nearby computer, and called Catherine to send her heads up on what she was doing. Computer initiate protocol C191 the computer obediently beeped and sent the command to Naruto, while Saren bit her lower lip in preparation. The protocol was designed to immobilize a Spartan who was either defective or had gone rogue. The Spartan's Mjolnir armor would effectively send what would be considered an elephant's punch worth of volts through the Spartan's spinal cord, which would kill a normal human and effectively incapacitate them however it risked the chance of completely destroying his nerves. Although knowing him, he'd probably get right back up without any problems. Saren smiled to herself for a moment, reclining herself against her chair, and staring at the ceiling in deep thought. I wonder if I should tease George today. Seamus is rubbing off on me. Seamus grimaced, as he shouldered half of Naruto's weight on his shoulder, glancing to Vivian who was tending to Catherine, who had her armor mangled, and melted in several parts. Well none of your bones are broken, but Halsey wouldn't be happy with how dinged up your armor is, Vivian muttered. Catherine frowned beneath her helmet, but nonetheless nodded her head at Vivian. Naruto's okay, and I'm still 67%, so I'm fine Catherine acknowledged Seamus with the blinking of her helmet status lights. Seamus bowed his head to her, and Catherine straightened herself with Vivian's help. The pelican should be here soon, we didn't blow up the university, but the thing is toddled anyways, plus the remaining aliens are gone, so for now we have nothing to worry about Catherine muttering. She looked at Vivian, and the sniper was silent, as she pulled herself away from Catherine, and pulled out her sniper rifle. Admiral Preston, this is Sierra 116, primary mission objective has been accomplished, and all enemy combatants have been dealt with, requesting immediate evac, over there was a brief static before Cole's voice broke through the interference. Fine work, soldiers. I might have to delay that order. Scanner picked up a high concentration of unknown energy located southwest of your location. I don't know what it is. The Covenant forces are swarming it. I need eyes on that site now. ODSTs will be busy assisting Marines so they can't do anything Catherine grimaced before turning to her team. She was about to refuse the order, citing the injuries of herself and her troops before Seamus's hand stopped her. 
Don't worry, Kath, me, and Viv can do this one. It's just Recon, right? Kath hesitated before sighing and nodding her head. Admiral, two members of my squad will be able to assist. However, myself and other members will have to return to the UNSC Everest. We're wounded. Cole made a solemn acknowledgement before the transceiver clicked off. Are you guys sure about this? Catherine looked uncertain between her two Spartans, but they merely shrugged their shoulders at her. These guys ain't so tough, and we can deal with them just fine, Seema said gruffly, hefting his SPNKR onto his back, and slamming a fresh magazine into his BR-55, while Vivian slid the bolt of her sniper rifle back, and shrugged to mission as a mission was what her shrug meant. Catherine still didn't like it, but when the pelican was spotted a few yards away from them, Catherine sighed, fine, but stay careful, the two Spartans nodded, and Vivian patted Seema on the back, a signal to move. The brown-haired Spartan watched, as two of her siblings moved towards where the unknown readings were coming from, before turning back to the slowly approaching pelican. I have a feeling I made a mistake. The snoring from an unconscious Naruto did little to ease her worries. Wine sighed to himself, as he untied Quen from his bindings. The Singeli miner was livid when he freed, and made sure to yell at Wine in the most undignified way he could. Most would see it as strange, considering Singeli were known for their discipline and honor. But for both Queen and White who had been sparring partners since they were little, they knew each other enough where honor and pleasantries were relatively non-existent. I have half a mind to kill you, and the other half agrees. Wyan smiled ruefully at his friend before calmly laying a hand down onto his shoulder. Now, now Quen, this is no time to act as a child. If at all possible Quen became angrier. He was about to yell again when his communication device started to beep. Quen silently gave his thanks to the deities up above. This is what Quen Fatimi Queen said in the comms. A scratchy voice answered their call. Thank the prophets you're alive. Has the outpost been destroyed? Quen sighed before looking towards the largely smoking buildings and the monument of corpses. Destroyed is too light a term Queen replied. Wyan laughed to himself quietly at the slightly gaping look that was present on Quen's face. Well that is of no concern to us. Quen was slightly surprised by the shout before he calmed himself and gripped his calm. Unit tighter. Sir? He questioned. There was silence on the other end before a soft whisper escaped through, we've discovered an active artifact, a surprise glance was shared in between the two Singeli, as they soaked the information in. The waypoint has been added, Quen, and hesitantly, Wyan picked up their weapons, and shouldered their emotions, as they raced forward to the designated site. Unaware of the smirking entity up above. The end, thanks for watching my video, leave a like, if you enjoyed my video, and also do consider subscribing to my channel for more awesome content. And make sure to check out the author of this fanfic, link is in the description, see you next time, till then sayonara.